Okay, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Krishna Kavi from University of North Texas, <coughs> Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, Nora Jones graduated from University of North Texas. And Don Henley also, of Eagles. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> Krishna has been director of the NSF Indiana uh, Industry University Research Center. He was department head in computer science and engineering at University of North Texas and has done amazing work in hardware, machine learning, security. So I would welcome you to go to his web page and read all about it. And also, I will let him get started on his presentation. I think I yeah. Thank you, Bharat. I <clears throat> uh, don't know uh, how many of you have hardware background in terms of actual processors and how pipelines work and how cache memories work. So what I'll do is I'll give a brief uh, introduction to how they work and how those features expose the hardware to security attacks. So my talk is on hardware side channel attacks. Most of you probably know what a side channel attack means compared to direct attack. So a side channel indicates that you observe certain properties about executing programs. And based on observation of those properties, you try to derive some secret information from the uh, application itself, uh, the program itself. So some examples of side channel are properties that you can observe is execution time of a program. So how long did the program take to execute? Based on that, you can predict which branch was taken, what value. So for example, in this, I don't know if you can see clearly, but you have branch paths there. So depending on execution times, you can find out which path was taken. And based on which path was taken, you also know what's the condition value at that branch. So that's one type of attack so you can predict. So for example, you can say in the branch, was the value zero or greater than zero? Maybe that was a condition used, so you can predict which value was used. So those are called timing attacks. And there are other types of attacks. People have uh, actually were successful, which is power and energy attacks. So you can estimate how much power was, how much energy was consumed by your application. Even based on that, you can predict what was the execution path, what were the values used, and those kinds of things. Or you can find out how many times a loop was executed. If the loop was executed longer, then it will take longer, it, it consumes more energy, and so on. And there were even some attacks observing electromagnetic uh, energy emitted by your screen, and then predict what was the actual values typed on the screen. So those are the examples of not interfering with the actual program execution, but observing properties. So what we are going to look at today is mostly based on timing attacks and a few other properties of the hardware. So there are two things that I'm going to focus today on. One is cache memory. The other one is speculative execution. And those are the two architectural features. I won't call them weaknesses, but the features of the architecture that were used to exploit Spectre and Meltdown. So let's look at how cache memory works. So if you're given an address, you're going to use a certain number of bits from the address. And can we see? Is this the same screen that you're seeing? I don't know. Yes. OK. So as you can see, the middle bits, those 10 bits of an address are used to locate a cache line to find out where your data is stored in your cache. Those are called index bits. All caches use the same set of index bits. So an attacker can evict your data as long as the attacker's address matches the index bits of the victim. So you can evict them, right? So that's uh, one of the property people exploit. Nowadays, we have something called set associative cache. Basically, set associative means an index identifies a number of cache lines, which is called a set. 
In this example, we have four. So one index identifies four lines, so your data may be in one of the four locations. But again, we are using a certain number of bits. And in most cases, we're using those bits so that we can use the modular arithmetic. So hardware is simple, so we can use those four bits, of those uh, bits, you know, index bits. So again, because any address uses the same mechanism, an attacker can evict victim's data and by evicting, you can find out if the attacker has the same uh, index bits or not, and based on that, you can exploit. I'll give an example of an exploit. Um, let me show you. This is called Bernstein's attack. Uh, was exposed about like maybe uh, 10 years ago. So basically, if you're using uh, encryption based on AES, what it, most implementations of AES, they, what they do is they, they pre-compute some values and store in the uh, tables. And you'll find out those values of the table by using an exclusive OR of a portion of the key, usually eight bits of the key, and eight bits of the plain text. That will give you an index into the table so that that describes some computation pre-computed on those values because otherwise it's going to take a long time to compute them, right? So now it's the table will, will go into a cache because table is data, contains data, so you have to bring the data into your cache. Once it gets into the cache, you're going to index it, you're going to find the entry, right? So based on index use, you know something about the key and the plain text values because that's nothing but exclusive one of those two, right? So you can do this several times to find all the uh, pieces of the, of the key. So that's what Bernstein's attack is. And that, this is part of also the a, uh, current specter attack. So once you get the data into cache, you can use these kinds of attacks to reveal that information. So that, that's it, I'm gonna go through this quick. So in order to perform these attacks, it's not that easy, but what you have to do is you have to have patience. You have to try several times to evict the right, uh, uh, amount of right indexes, right entries in the table, and you have to repeat this several times because each time you only get a portion of the key, so you have to repeat it several times to find the entire key. You, know, you also have to know if the data is evicted or not. So you have to know if cache entry is evicted. If the cache is evicted, it causes cache miss. If it causes cache miss, your program takes longer to execute, right? So you have to be able to measure execution time in a very fine-grained level so that you know if the cache caused a miss or not. So these are not easy, but they're doable. If you have the patience, if you know how to use the right tools, you can do that. So these are uh, tools which are available to anybody to use in Linux. So hardware has something called performance counters. So you can use performance counters to measure how many cache misses are uh, caused by your program, how many times the AND instructions were executed, if you want, how many times the multiply instructions is executed. All of those are available so that you can optimize your code, right? So those are made available for good reasons, but people can use that to attack. So there are three types of cache attacks that are commonly grouped together. One is called prime and probe, this gener generic name. Prime means the attacker fills the entire cache. Every single line of the cache is filled by attacker's data. So cache is fully full, right, with the attacker's information. Now when the victim's program starts executing, Victim needs to uh, replace the data so be, because he has to bring, the victim's program has to bring its own data. Now when the attacker comes back and tries to execute, he can discover that some of his data has been evicted, right? Because it causes cache misses. Based on that, you can know exactly what data items are evicted, and based on that, what is the index. From that, you can get additional information of the, of the victim. So that's called prime and uh, probe. It's prime because you're priming the uh, cache by filling it fully with your data, victim's, uh, attacker's data. The second one is called evict and time. This way you don't fill the entire cache. You selectively evict victim's data. 
So you just basically try to store some uh, data into cache line. And then if that causes a miss for the victim, then you know the victim accessed that data item, right? If a victim accessed the data item and you evicted that, so victim is going to take longer, so it's going to ca cause a cache miss. So that's also you can uh, time it and find out which lines the victim may have accessed. So this type of uh, attack called evict and time. So you're selectively evicted. So you can start evicting one line at a time. If the attacker uses that uh, uh, line, that means the uh, victim uses that line, the victim is going to uh, cause a cache miss, it's going to take longer. If the victim does not, did not touch that line, it will not cause a cache miss. So you know that the victim did, did not use that address. And the third type of uh, attack is flush and reload. And this is particularly useful if you have multi-core processors. So you don't have to run on the same core as a victim. So your attack program doesn't have to run on the same core as a victim. In multi-core, using this, you can evict all the caches for everybody, including every course cache plus shared cache. So this is a, a called a flush and reload. So you're going to flush all caches. And that can be done using a simple uh, uh, Intel instruction called C flush. So if you use C flush, it evicts all the caches. So you can use that. This way, you don't have to run on the same core as the victim and still uh, uh, observe properties. So those are the three most commonly used uh, types of cache attacks. And actually, this, this last attack can be used to r reveal which pages are used or shared by the victim and the uh, uh, attacker, because operating system and other libraries are shared by everybody. So you can find out what portions are uh, used. And the, the types of solutions commonly used for this are, I, I group them into two types. One is partitioning. The other one is randomizing. These are the two solutions people have been uh, talking about. Partitioning, as you would uh, probably envision, is dividing the cache into different parts and run different programs in different parts of the cache so the attacker cannot evict. So for example, there are several uh, proposals. Uh, ARM, if you use ARM uh, processors, and ARM, ha if you're using the ARM trusted zone, which is supports uh, trusted uh, 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 support, if you're going to use uh, trusted zones for running applications, each application is going to be flagged, whether it's a secure application or not. So the cache will also be uh, flagged with one bit saying that this cache line belongs to a secure application or non-secure application. So uh, the attacker, if he's running in a non-secure portion, will not be able to evict secure lines. So ARM claims that you, know, you can't evict our lines, but some people have, can you hear? No, he's typing something oh. and I can't hear. Okay. So there's uh, a paper recently showing that ARMS, uh, that the one bit indicating whether it's a secure application or not doesn't protect because we, we talked about prime and probe. Prime means a prime that store the entire cache before the secure application uh, is loaded, right? So you already occupied all of that. When the secure application comes, the attacker's lines are still uh, evicted. Even though you cannot evict a victim's lines, your lines are evicted, so you can still find out from there. So they have proven that this doesn't really protect. So the other way of all, uh, dividing cache is just uh, partition the cache and say these cache lines belong to uh, secure applications, these are uh, belong to non-secure applications. Remember I talked about a set associative caches where you have several lines together, one set. So recently, a paper from, from MIT, just in this, uh, March, uh, December 2018, uh, they propose using different lines in a set for secure and non-secure applications. So in this example, there are eight ways. That means eight cache lines together has one address, one index. Those are called eight ways, eight ways. So for example, that red ones, W0 and W1, are allocated for secure applications. The others are not. So 
you will never able, be able to touch those two lines. You will not get any information about those two lines. But again, the prime and probe is not protected by this, right? But you, when you prime, you fill the entire cache, so you can still find out that somebody evicted your lines or not. So the other type is randomizing. So one proposal from Princeton several years ago is uh, to use an additional table per called permutation table. So you take the index and use the index into a permutation table, and the permutation table gives you some new random address. So use that random address for cache. So even though attacker and victim have the same index, they use different random numbers to say where the data is placed. So this way, uh, attacker would, does not really know by evicting a cache line that the attacker and victim has the same index, because index has been changed. The main problem with this one is you have an extra table that you have to look up. So you cannot access cache directly. So you have to use the index, then go into the permutation table, and then go to the cache. Cache, the reason why we use cache is because we want to make memory access very fast, right? By adding this extra layer, your speed is going to go down, right? So you're losing performance by doing this. The second thing is somebody has to load those permutation tables. So every time you start running your program, you have to first fill these permutation tables, right? So that's an extra overhead. So what we proposed is a much simpler solution. Just change which, which bits you are going to use for index. Why do you have to use the same bits for everybody as an index? Remember I've shown you those 10 bits in the, your address as your index? Why do you have to use the same 10 bits? Why not use some different combinations of bits? So the victim, you will use a different set of bits, and the uh, attacker will use the different bits. Right? So no two programs use the same portion of your address. That way you won't be able to predict, right? So this way you don't have to change uh, the extra hardware. You don't have to go to another table to find you know, an index and so on. So by just changing the bits, we get the same effect of randomizing. But which bits do you use, right? So we studied different solutions. One solution uh, we did was, Take the standard uh, index bits and take some bits from the tag and exclusive order them. So your tag would be different from attacker's tag because those addresses will be different. So just take and exclusive order them, you can create a new index. So it's a very simple solution, right? The hardware is very simple. And you can think of other ways. I'll show you some data quickly. So we studied this. How much performance are you going to lose or gain by using this method? So we studied for several benchmarks, and we ran it on a four-core system, assuming four cores, and four cores running four different programs. Each program, you use slightly different indexing method, saying that how much performance are you going to lose by doing that. As it, this shows the, how many cache misses are caused, what's the miss rate you know, at L3, shared level, last level cache. As you can see, the difference is not significant. So the first line, the blue line to the left in each of those uh, sets of data is original. That means no standard indexing. And the other things are slightly different variations running on different types of processors, the AMD processor or Intel processor and so on. As you notice, the di difference is not that significant. So you're really not losing significant performance by changing the indexing. We also studied the actual execution time. So again, for the same benchmarks, how much performance are you losing? So as you can see, the performance loss is 1% or 2% in that range. So we feel that this is accept acceptable performance loss that you can tolerate but achieve security uh, against cache attacks. Right? And we tried other uh, type of solutions. Instead of exclusive ORing, can we use an AND? Can we use an AND and stuff like that? Uh, for, uh, the index bits plus some tag bits, do you exclusive or, do you AND them, do you OR them, and so on. But we found out AND is really bad. <laughs> so if you use AND, the performance loss can be significant. Whereas exclusive OR is very good, exclusive doesn't lose much performance, 
but if you do add, you lose quite a bit, as you can see. So what we need to do is try different combinations. Here it shows performance loss and you know, so on. So what we need to do, I'm sorry. Yeah, so what we need to do is study different ways of changing indexing, randomizing it, so that every time your program is uh, loaded, operating system decides what index to use, right? And it can change randomly. So now, attacker would never be able to predict if you have the same index bits or not. I mean, you can predict because you have a finite number of combinations. If you run a million times, you can still predict. But you're making it so much more difficult for the attacker. The second uh, type of attack is primarily based on speculation. So when you talk about timing analysis, the timing is based on the fact that all architectures use speculative execution. So let me talk briefly about what speculative execution means from an architecture point of view. If you're taking any architecture uh, class, you must have seen this diagram, right? This is from Hennessy and Patterson <laughs> you know, a book. So you have the five, line, five, five pipeline stages, instruction phase, decode, execute, and so on, right? So if you have a, a branch instruction, you know the branch instruction uh, is being executed in the decode stage, right? When you decode it, you know you have a branch instruction. But you have to wait until the execute stage to find out if the branch is going to be taken or not taken. So if you don't do anything, you're going to lose two cycles, right? In these five, five uh, pipeline stages. But most of today's architectures may have like 20 stages of pipe, you know, pipelines. So branches can cause about 20 cycle loss. So in order to avoid that, what we're going to do is we're going to predict whether the branch is going to be taken or not, even before we know the decision and start executing instructions for the predicted path. That way, if you're correct, you won't lose any uh, uh, cycles. But if you're mispredict, then you lose cycles, right? So then the goal is to make your prediction as accurate as possible. So here is an example. Uh, simple loop, you know, you have, uh, you're adding, incrementing an array by one, right, simple loop. So what, when I say speculative execution, here it shows when each of the instruction is going to be complete, completed, look at the uh, last uh, column to the right, just before the comments. Commit, it says commit uh, at cycle number. So that indicates when the instruction actually completed, right? Now look at load instruction from the second iteration. So if you look at the iteration number in the first column, one, so second uh, iteration, the load instruction should not start until cycle nine, executing, right? Because the branch from the first iteration is not completed in cycle eight. So you should not start load until we know that branch is gonna be taken until, and start executing next iteration in cycle nine, right? But what speculative execution say, hey, this is a loop, so chances are you're going to repeat it. So it's going to predict. And predict and start executing, as you can see, it started executing cycle four, cycle five, load from the second iteration. And if you're lucky, if your branch is going to be taken, everything is going to go well, right? You saved, instead of waiting until cycle nine, you started executing cycle five, that means you saved four cycles. So that's the idea behind speculation. You have a question? No. And what's more interesting about this, this is how, where the security attacks come into play. So let's look at this example of a loop. This loop sh should only execute 100 times, right? When I equals 100, what happens? We should not execute. We should not execute next cycle, next iteration, right? But what does our speculation do? In, this, in the 99, when I equals 99, and when I, next cycle comes, we predict that you're going to take the branch, and we go ahead and execute it. What happened then? You fetched B100. You're not supposed to get B100. You already got B100, right? The system say, hey, this is wrong. You should not execute it. Whenever we get the data, it goes into the cache. 
the data. If it is not in the cache already, you bring it from memory into the cache. So when I say load, I'm bringing the data into the cache. Even if the program says you, sh you know, should not fetch this, instance, uh, this data, you are not going to take the data away from the cache. You're going to leave the data in the cache. Now the attacker has access to the data because you can use the cache attacks to reveal that information. So that's the behind, that's the attack that Spectre and Meltdown uses. So basically, the, it knows that you're going to execute speculatively and try to execute illegal operations. And it's going to fetch the data. So for example, you're not supposed to access kernel uh, tables, right, from the user code, but try, try to get it, get the data from the kernel tables and the speculation may get the data for you already, even though operating system will kill your program, then you can use a different program to reveal the information from the cache. So you can have two programs on the attacker side. One to try to illegally get the data into the cache, and another to reveal the data from the cache. That's how Spectre and Meltdown type of attacks work. Again, it's not easy. You have to try so many times to get, be able to get that data. So. So again, that's the, uh, how these two attacks work. And again, these are because how cache memories are designed, how speculation works, right? So basically how the speculation works is you have a table called branch prediction table. And you usually use two bits in the branch prediction saying that if branch is predicted correctly or not, if you mispredict a branch two times, then we change the prediction. There is a reason why we wait for two times to be mispredicted, but that's, you know, if you're taking architecture, you probably know why that is. So we use two bits, and you use the same prediction unless you mispredict it two times in a row. If you mispredict it two times in a row, we change the prediction to the opposite. So if you initially predicted branch is going to be taken, and you mispredict it two times, you change it to branch not taken, right? And the next thing we also do is we have this table called a branch target buffer. So what the branch target buffer does is it, uh, I guess, can you see my cursor? No? No. OK. Uh, so you have the address of the instruction that you're going to execute if the branch is taken. So this table contains the address where you're going to jump to if the branch is taken. So if you predicted branch is going to be taken, you already have the address of where you're going to branch, so you can start fetching the instruction from that address and start executing. So you won't lose any cycles. So that's why we need this table, and this table is going to be indexed by the branch instruction. So in the previous example, we have branch not equals. So the branch not equals instruction has an address, the program counter address. We use the program counter address and use it, that as an index into this table. This table tells you if the branch is going to be predicted as taken or not taken. And if it is predicted as taken, then we also have the address or where you're going to branch to. Okay, so you have all the information you need to start executing immediately the next instruction. But once you start executing instructions speculatively, we need to make sure that if the prediction is not correct, we have to undo all the computations, right? If the branch is mispredicted, you have to undo or add instructions that follow or multiply instructions we follow. So what we do for that is they have a buffer called reorder buffer. So if you see on the right hand top, and there's a reorder buffer. So all the instructions except load and store, store their results in this buffer only when we are ready to say that branch is correctly predicted, so these instructions are correctly executed, we won't copy that data into the right locations. So we buffer the data into the buffers until we know whether you executed correctly or not. However, load instructions still get the data into cache. So some new solutions, oh, by the way, one of the things we did was what if we randomly make the architecture mispredict? So remember we talked about timing attack. Timing attack is assuming the branch prediction is correct and you know, works normally so we can find the times. 
if I force the hardware to mispredict randomly, I'm changing the timing, right? So that it will become more difficult for timing attacks to know when I uh, mis uh, made the architecture to mispredict. So one way to do that is just clear the table uh, bits, right? We, if you remember, we have the two bits for branch prediction, right? Periodically, I'm going to reset to zeros, all of them. So the hardware mispredicts, right? So depending on when I re reset it, the execution time changes completely. So the timing attacks become much more difficult. So here is an example. If you look at the table I've shown you uh, in the two columns there, one column says that if your uh, prediction is correct, how your instructions are going to look like when they're executed. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to make it mispredict. So we're going to say that branch is not taken, so even though loops normally take, I'm mispredicting. So it shows how the instructions look like when they execute based on misprediction. So as you can see, the number of instructions executed, number of cycles needed will be completely different, right? So we can think of randomly clearing the table, right? So what we did was, what if, if I cleared the table for every 10,000 instructions? every 100,000 instructions, every million instructions, and so on, how much performance am I going to lose? If you clear the table more frequently, you're going to lose more performance, right? So effectively, if I clear every cycle, what's going to happen? It means like you don't have any speculative execution, right? There's no speculation because you mispredict it every time. So we can do that or say never clear, then it's going to have full speculation. So you can change randomly how often it's going to mispredict. So if you look at, I don't know if you can see the uh, data, uh, data. So uh, if you mispredicted every 100 million instructions, you only lose like 0.1%. Whereas if you uh, cleared it every 10,000 uh, uh, instructions, you might lose about 10%. So you have a range on how much performance are you willing to lose how much more difficult you want to make for the timing attacks. So you can change that, you know. So. Again, we need to look at many more solutions, many more uh, simulations, more examples, more tests to do this, so we're working on that. And we want, actually what we want to do is launch Spectre attack and find out the timing differences, how much more difficult would be to predict how many times, how many more times you have to use this specter attack before you reveal the information. And the next uh, progress in uh, is trying to uh, uh, mitigate the attacks, the solutions for this is can we somehow make this uh, speculative load not visible? That's why we call silent speculative loads. That means treat whenever you're loading the data speculatively to be different from normal load instruction. Remember, when you have speculative load, the data comes to the cache, right? That's how the attacker reveals information about the data. So if you bring it into the cache, even though that uh, load should not have been executed, the data is already in the cache. And there are other type of things that happens when you bring it into the cache. There's something called metadata that is also going to change. Metadata is like, for example, when, when was the cache line last accessed? So we have the LRU bits, last, uh, least recently used bits, which are used to find out which cache line you're going to evict, if you have to evict. So that's called metadata. And there are some other things. Coherency, if you two, uh, core, two cores share the data, and one core writes, you had to invalidate the other data and so on. So those kinds of coherence information is also called a metadata. So if you bring the data into the cache, you have to, you may change the metadata or the actual cache data. So can I go back to my slide? So there's a paper again, appear in December this year, what they're proposing is use a buffer for load. So don't use the cache memory when you're doing speculative load. So you have a separate buffer, so you bring the data into the buffer rather than into the cache so that if you 
mispredicted the cash uh, uh, data, that's not going to be visible in the cache. So the attacker would not know that you actually read that data. So you have to have an extra buffer. But this causes some problems. So for one thing, it causes performance because if somebody else accesses the same cache data, you have to go back and read from memory because that still will be as a cache miss. So you have some loss because if you brought the data into the cache, you would have avoided one cache miss, but now you're causing additional cache misses. So you lose uh, some information. But more significant is how do we handle cache coherency issues? So let's take an example. I've shown you the, here two cores, right? Let's assume that both cores use, uh, share the same data. That means they access the same uh, uh, cache line, uh, same information. Core one gets the data speculatively, so it comes to the buffer, and cache is not being modified. So core two does not have any information that core one accessed the data, right? Suppose core two gets the data and modifies the data, right? What should happen to the data in the buffer? Should it become invalid because core two already read the data? Or should we say that core one actually read the data before core two, so the data should be valid still? So we have to make decisions as to saying that which one will be invalidated, right? So that's called uh, memory ordering. So we have to find out who read first, right? Which order should we use? So I think, let me see. Uh, so here is a timeline if you want to think of. So we have a speculative load first in core one. And then sometime later, the second core read and modified the data. And now the speculation was correct. And core one says, okay, I'm going to use the data. So I re read the data before, so all the instructions use my old data, right? But that should be invalidated because core two modified the data already by that time. So you have to kill all everything you have done because your data is no longer valid, even though you read the data first, right? So you're going to cause a lot of performance loss because the way this solution, this paper talks about is when you commit, when you're ready to commit the load instruction, so far nobody knows that you read the data, right? So you need to make everybody know that you read the data. So they issue a, a normal load second time. So first time you have speculative load, you got the data into your uh, buffer. When you're ready to commit, you again call, uh, issue an instruction, say I'm reading the data now, right? So that everybody can see it at that time. And at that time, the second core says, hey, hey, I have a new data, by the way, read this data. So now we have inval invalidate all of that data. But today's processors don't do that. Today's processors, because they read the data, the data is already in the cache, so core one's read precedes core two's modification. So core one is allowed to use the data because it's read before. Right? So today's architectures use a different uh, memory ordering, and the new idea will use a completely different memory ordering. So which one will people accept? Because if you run on one uh, system, you might get different answer compared to running on a different system. So you might have different ordering. So people have to uh, explore how this is going to impact your correctness, program correctness, and all of those. But this is a good solution so that we can make the loads, speculated loads, invisible. Actually, we were working on it, and then suddenly these people beat us to the you know the deadline. So they, they got the paper out, and we did. You know, so we had exactly the same solution we are exploring. So, so what we are going to look at is, I don't know how many of you know the transactional memory models. I was going to talk to Dr. Obergawa by saying that architecture also uses transaction models, concurrency models, and stuff like that <laughs> nowadays. So basically what we want to do is look at a sequence of instructions as a single transaction. Right? So all the instructions in that sequence will either commit or do not commit. So they have to be all committed together or none of them will be committed. Right? So in architecture, if we start doing that, we can say that a sequence of instructions which are executed speculatively will be a transaction. So if we find out that your load is 
invalid because somebody else modified the data, we're going to kill all the speculatively executed instruction. So we're going to keep it in buffer. So we are exploring, saying that we want to extend that other paper where they're looking at only single speculative instruction, but we want to extend the whole thing as it, make it as a transaction. So look at speculative execution, convert that into a transaction model, and find out how much performance you're going to lose, how the solution works. So that's what we are working. Hopefully, they won't do the same thing before we do. So, <laughs> so. One final thing, I just want to talk about hardware level security uh, issues. Um, most of today's processors, particularly Xeon processors, use hyperthreading. So hyperthreading basically, basically means on a single core, they can mix multiple th uh, threads together and run it through the pipeline. So you can have four threads. Sometimes you, you might see that 10 cores, 40 threads, that means each core can run four threads at a time and they mix together those instructions. When you mix those instructions, there's a problem because they share certain tables. They use TLB tables, for example. Transaction, like I said, buffer tables. So now one thread running on the same core can try to get information about the TLB entries of some other thread. So now we can actually reveal page table information, which is very you know like dangerous uh, so th there are some attacks that's one of the reasons why coffee lake now it has two options latest intel two options either you can buy one which enables hyper threading one which it doesn't so if you want a more secure buy one without hyper threading you might lose some performance but at least you can avoid some of the attacks so they give you the option of doing that so so That's what I wanted to talk about today, basically about what uh, side channel attacks and hardware level means, give you an idea uh, what features of the architecture enables those attacks, and what is the current thinking in pr protecting it. By the way, there's no software solution for this. You cannot prevent these attacks by simply using software. So we have to change the hardware. So Intel has to get rid of all of those over a period of time, until that time, any uh, uh, Intel processor is prone to those attacks. So there's no software solution for this. <laughs> you know, so, so Intel knows that. That's why they're working on it. You know, so. So, thank you. To press and then push to ask a question. Any questions? Thank you, sir. I, I have one question. Um, I mean, I, it's not really a software a solution, but it's a solution without changing the hardware, which is basically you cannot allow untrusted code to run on your hardware uh, when you're running something that that is that you're concerned about. That that basically you're saying all code is trusted. Right, so you, uh, attacker's code can be trusted too, if, in well, principle, because you don't, you, all they're doing is between loading and unloading data, right? So, well, <laughs> that's what I mean. It's it's not that attacker's code is, uh, you know, the it's doing it is doing something. Uh, you know, the question is, is it, who's it trusted by? I mean, it's like if I have all my own code that only I have created, right. I've checked it out. Right and nothing else can run on the processor at the time, then this should... So I, I can write a matrix multiplication, and at the very beginning I can create a loop. All it does is it clears all my huge matrices, right? What's happening to the cache then? So my code is perfectly valid code because I'm writing this huge matrix multiplication with, uh, yeah. which multiplies million by million, and at the very beginning I cleared my matrices. That's, so, that's enough to clear all the caches. Yeah. So in other words, it's, it's very difficult to validate that code would not right. be performing this attack. That's correct, right. So attack, that's what attackers use because you cannot, none of the verification techniques you have in software will be able to uh, say with confidence that this could potentially you know, be a, a side channel attack. So that's why I was talking to Intel. Yeah. Intel said, is there a way we can detect a side channel attack? All right? 
The only thing you can do side channel attack is if the side channel attack is causing more cash misses, maybe you can say that there's something wrong here, right? Normally, your system should not cause this many cash misses. And suddenly, when two programs are running, it's causing a lot of cash misses. So there's something suspicious, right? That's all you can say. Beyond that, you don't know what's happening. So, so uh, yeah, Intel was looking at, is there a way to find that there is a side channel attack being you know, happening right now, you know? So. Well, it, it does require, though, that you have, um, that you have an, another thread or process right. running on the processor before you, yours has completely finished its task. That's, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, hyper-threading, some people now saying that I don't want to use hyper-threading. Yeah, because but remember, that makes, yeah, yeah. This, this doesn't require hyper-threading, but it does require something else running on the same processor. It doesn't right? have to be in the same processor. Remember, there's something called C flush, which uh, evicts all the cache lines every place. Okay, so, so it's not even on the same processor, right. it's on the, the same multi -core, system. Right, right, See, as long as the multi-core clears all the cache. Well, no, it's, I, I'm not saying, saying not same core, but, but I'm the saying same if multi-core processors be running on a different core, you run... You so it's not, but, but, but the processor itself, if I run, the, that I have a completely independent processor, right. that there's nothing running on any of the other cores... Yeah, I mean, then, then why would you want a, a processor with that many cores and not use them, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, right. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, from Intel's point of view, maybe these, you know, if that's right. the solution, right. then right. you sell more processors. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, you know, that's why if you're running, you're, you're the right. only one user, yeah. I have 32 cores, but I'm only running one. <laughs> you but know, basically, that's time. the only <laughs> solution at this point is yeah. that you have to be the exclusive so what, user what, of the processor. So what they're trying to do is all these different solutions, saying that I want to make sure that secure uh, applications have reserved cache <laughs> lines, even though not all attacks are you know, pre pre uh, prevented, some attacks are prevented, plus most of the Unix, they have the deduplication. For example, when you have two programs running, they share some tables, right? So some pages, you know, the common uh, libraries and so on. The reason why they do that is you don't want to duplicate and waste memory. That's what God, that's what it's called deduplication, eliminate duplication. But there's a flag in Linux saying that I want duplicate copies. So eliminate deduplication, you know? So that you have a flag to say that I don't want as to use somebody else's. I don't want to share somebody else's libraries. Give me my own copies, right? So you're willing to lose some performance because of that. So there are some people thinking about in how do we do this, sacrifice some performance, but try to mitigate the attacks. Mm -hmm. So, but the Linux solution, when they first came out, you know, as soon as Spectre attack was revealed, Linux said that you can use this, that, then immediately they said, oh, we're losing 40% performance. It's not acceptable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so. But they said that the only solution is change hardware. Yes. Like, even if you uh, lose some performance, like, uh, all these attacks will not work, right? Uh, like, for uh, the uh, meltdown attack, it just had a software fix of where you just make the uh, uh, user applications and the system applications have, like, completely different memory. So, uh, this should work, right? Of what kind of attacks will... Uh, 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 this not stop. But because speculation, you cannot prevent the speculation where even uh, secure cache lines will be brought into the cache, right? So the data will be brought into the cache. Even though you're not allowed to access this, you can illegally try to get the data. System will kill your, uh, abort your program, but the data is already brought into the cache. So that's, that's the reason behind speculative you know, attack and Spectre meltdown, those cannot be prevented. It's going to be more difficult. It takes longer time to do that, but you cannot prevent unless you modify the speculation somehow. So we have to address the idea of, if I'm doing speculative execution, and if I'm going to read the data, should I reveal the data or not, right? 
So right now you're revealing the data because you're bringing it to the cache. And that's the reason why the last two slides I talk about making the speculative execution silent, the speculative load silent. That means if you bring the data in a speculative mode, don't change any system state. So actually what we want to do is formalize this, saying that in any hardware, if I do something, what changes are observable in the system state, right? So what I want to see is if I do something speculative, I want to make sure that my state changes are not observable by other people. So how do we do that? How do we design such that if I do something to speed up, I don't want to reveal that I'm doing that. I don't want that information to be revealed. So what we are looking at, what are all these state changes? For example, I didn't talk about there. One of the things nobody has talked about so far is performance counters, right? So performance counters, as I said, counts how many times your cache misses, or you can even count how many times a branch instruction is executed, how many times a load uh, multiply instruction is executed, right? Even though I hid the information that I did something speculative, your performance counters are still counting how many times your load instructions are executed. So what we want to do is make sure that the speculative load doesn't even change this performance counter, <coughs> right? So we have to think in terms of what state changes are happening whenever I execute something. I, I want to make that as uh, you know, silent, as non-observable as possible so the attacker cannot use side channel attacks. Remember, side channel attack means <coughs> observing something. I want to make my speculating, uh, speculative execution as unobservable as possible. Hmm. Any other questions? Because I have to run and try to <laughs> go all the way to uh, uh, Indianapolis to catch my flight. So. But pl please send uh, an email or any other questions you may have. Okay.